For Gen Xers, getting a job as a teenager was a must. The day I turned 14, I got a work permit and applied at the local burger joint. Got a job as a car hop and was earning 100 bucks a shift in tips. And that money meant independence in a car the day I turned 16. This is a common story among Gen Xers. We wanted to work as soon as we could, and the opportunities were everywhere, no matter where you lived. Xers saw their first job as a rite of passage. And the crazy thing is, many of us had jobs that today's teens probably don't even know existed. Things have definitely changed. Thanks to the 21st century economy and the employment landscape, plus advanced technology, jobs for teenagers these days don't look much like they did back in the 80s and 90s. So here's a glimpse into a bygone era filled with charm, quirks, and a whole lot of character as we go through my list of Gen X teen jobs that no longer exist. Working at a record store in the 1980s and 90s as a teenager was pretty much a dream job for Gen Xers. It was a unique experience that combined passion for music with a sense of community. The record store was a hub of musical discovery with posters of iconic bands plastered on the walls and the constant hum of music playing in the background. If you were lucky enough to land a job at a record store, chances are you were already deeply passionate about music. Whether you were into classic rock, punk, hip hop, new wave, or any other genre, this was the place to indulge. Most small towns had some kind of indie music store that hired at least one or two teen workers. Those were hard jobs to get. Or if you live near a mall, you could land a job at a chain store like Sam Goody, Camelot, or Tape World. In the cities, there were jobs at mega stores like Tower Records. One of the most exciting aspects of working at a record store was the opportunity to discover new music. You'd often come across lesser known bands or underground releases that would become your personal favorites. The job was a constant opportunity for music discussions. Customers would share their favorite bands, debate the merits of different albums, and sometimes even introduce you to music that you hadn't heard before. In the 80s and early 90s, vinyl records were still a popular format with their large covers and warm sound. Many customers preferred the tactile experience of flipping through vinyl sleeves and reading album liner notes and carefully selecting their next purchase for their collections. Mixtapes were a big part of the music scene at the time, too, and customers would often ask for song suggestions. It was truly a skill to curate the perfect mix for any person or occasion. As the 90s progressed, cassette tapes gave way to CDs, which offered clearer sound quality and greater durability. But do you guys remember the long box CD packaging when that first came out? crazy. The transition from tapes to CDs marked a significant shift in the music industry and record stores played a central role in this evolution. But with the rise of digital music downloads and streaming services, the era of the record store gradually came to an end. Most iconic record stores have closed their doors, leaving behind a legacy of music fandom and community, but with no more teen jobs for Gen Z or Gen Alpha. If you lived in a suburban or rural area where physical phone books were widely used in the 80s and 90s, chances are a teenager helped deliver them to your home or business. While some areas did have their phone book deliveries done by the local phone company, others hired teens for the task of annual phone book delivery for both the yellow and white pages. This job involved carrying a stack of phone books and walking or biking through neighborhoods to drop off a book at each doorstep. Before hitting the streets, you'd typically receive a batch of phone books that you had to sort and organize. This might involve separating them by neighborhood or by street to make the delivery process more efficient. You'd also have to package each book in a plastic bag. At least that's how I remember it back in the 90s. Delivery routes were usually predetermined with specific areas assigned to each delivery person. The goal was to cover the entire area within a certain time frame, ensuring that every household received a phone book. Phone book delivery was a job that required physical stamina. Walking or biking from house to house, often carrying a heavy sack of books, could be quite the workout. Since deliveries were made directly to people's homes and businesses, the job meant spending a lot of time outdoors, and one of the benefits of this job was the independence it offered. Delivery people were typically given a route and expected to complete it on their own with minimal supervision. For teens, balancing school and other activities, Phone book delivery was a nice gig when it popped up. Deliveries could be done after school hours or on weekends, making it an easy way to earn some extra cash. Pizza Hut's iconic Red Roof restaurants were a staple of many communities in the 1980s and 90s. The restaurants had a distinct look with their red brick exteriors, large windows, and their red soda cups inside with their jukebox, and of course, a tiny all-you-can-eat salad bar and pizza buffet. 
people actually went there to dine in with their families, and a server would serve up yummy pan pizzas, breadsticks, and beer on tap. Okay, yeah, you had to be 18 to serve that. According to former Pizza Hut servers like myself, the salad bar was this amazing force field that somehow managed to keep the cigarette smoke separated from the non-smoking section and the other side. It must have been the kale. Smokers tip better than non-smokers, the songs Don't Worry, Be Happy and Kokomo were overplayed on the jukebox, and Book It kids were always so excited to get their personal pan pieces they earned by reading books. To say those pizzas were made with care is an understatement. Many Gen Xers were the Book It kids in the 80s and then went on to serve up pizzas in the 90s. With wages and tips, you could make good money as a Pizza Hut server, like 20 bucks an hour. That would be like 40 to 50 bucks an hour today. Of course, the trade-off was that you would go home smelling like the worst ashtray on the planet after every shift, but at least you could bring home a pizza and breadsticks every shift for the mistakes and leftovers. And let's not forget those polyester uniforms. Those were for the older Gen Xers, though. By the time I was a Pizza Hut server in the mid-90s, you only had to wear a red polo and a visor. But it was a sweet gig anyways. Back in the 80s, arcades often served as community gathering spots where gamers of all ages would come together to socialize and compete. As an attendant, you were at the center of this social scene, fostering a sense of camaraderie among your patrons. Being an arcade attendant in the 80s was an experience steeped in the vibrant culture of gaming that was rapidly expanding during that era. Arcades were bustling hubs filled with the sounds of electronic music, the flashing lights of arcade cabinets, and the chatter of excited players. As an attendant, you were right in the middle of that energetic environment. You'd interact with a wide range of people, from kids who spent their allowances on games to seasoned players trying to set high scores. You'd need good communication skills to assist players, offer tokens or change, and ask or answer questions about games. Arcade machines weren't always the most reliable things either, so part of your job involved basic technical troubleshooting. This might include fixing coin jams, adjusting controls, or rebooting glitchy machines. Regular maintenance was crucial to keeping the arcade running smoothly. This involved tasks like cleaning screens and control panels, replacing buttons or joysticks, and ensuring all games were in working order. Arcade attendants often witnessed intense gaming competitions as players vied for high scores and bragging rights, and keeping track of high scores on each machine and possibly organizing tournaments was part of the fun of the job. You needed a good understanding of the games in your arcade. Players might ask for recommendations or tips on how to beat certain levels, so being knowledgeable about the games was important for providing excellent customer service. Arcades had their share of security concerns, of course. You needed to keep an eye out for potential troublemakers and ensure fair play among patrons to, and handle any conflicts that arose. But overall, being an arcade attendant in the 80s was a dynamic and exciting job that allowed you to be part of the burgeoning gaming culture of the time. Being a video store clerk in the 1980s and 90s was a quintessential Gen X teen job, and it held a unique charm and experience that's pretty much impossible to replicate today. A workplace lined wall to wall with VHS tapes and later DVDs, the video store often had a distinct smell, a mix of popcorn, plastic, and the faint scent of cardboard. One of the best parts of the job was getting to watch the new releases before they hit the store shelves, and also recommending movies to customers. You had to know the inventory inside and out, from the, la from the latest releases to the hidden gems. Customers would often come in with a vague idea what they wanted to watch, and it was your job to guide them to the perfect film. You'd often have regular customers who would come in every week, sometimes even daily. You'd get to know their movie preferences, and they'd trust your recommendations. A big part of the job was ensuring that all the tapes were in their correct sections, and this meant alphabetizing the movies, placing them in the right genres, and making sure the new releases were prominently displayed. When customers came to rent a movie, you'd take their membership card and scan it and then hand over the chosen tapes. Sometimes there were late fees to collect, which could lead to some interesting interactions. Returns involved checking the tapes for any damage and then restocking them on the shelves. The worst part of the job was calling people on the late list and telling them they needed to return their movies. Late fees were a significant part of the rental business model, often causing moments of tension when customers returned tapes a day or two late. At Family Video, the managers actually did home visits to try to retrieve their movies that were more than 30 days late. Seriously. And don't forget the dreaded Be Kind Rewind stickers on every tape, reminding customers to rewind before returning to avoid extra charges. 
But with the rise of streaming services like Netflix and the decline of physical media, video rental stores gradually faded away. The experience of browsing shelves, chatting with clerks, and the tangible excitement of holding a physical movie in your hand has become a thing of the past. Working in a photo lab in the 80s and 90s was an interesting job that involved handling physical film and the art of developing and printing photographs. And you got to look at everyone's pictures, which is kind of weird when you think about it. Customers would actually drop off their rolls of exposed film from their vacations, family events, or just everyday moments they wanted to capture to let a lab turn that film into prints. Some Gen X teens worked at tiny photo huts where the film was mailed off to a lab and the customers would return in a few days to pick up their photos. And then as technology advanced, the more common photo huts were one-hour spots where you had an actual machine on site. Customers would drop off their film rolls and lab technicians worked quickly and efficiently as the film processing machines were designed to develop the film in just a few minutes. These machines were the heart of the one-hour photo lab. They automatically developed the film rolls, allowing technicians to work on other tasks simultaneously. Enlargers were used to create prints from the developed film, and technicians could adjust settings for exposure, contrast, and color balance to get the desired results. Of course, as digital cameras became more popular and then the advent of the smartphone, the demand for film processing declined. Many one-hour photo labs either closed down or transitioned to offering digital printing services. Despite the decline of one-hour photo labs, though, there has been a resurgence of interest in film photography in recent years. There are a few labs that still exist, catering to enthusiasts who appreciate the nostalgic charm of film. Being a movie theater projectionist in the 80s and 90s was a unique and fascinating job, offering team workers a blend of technical skills, a little behind-the-scenes excitement, as well as a front-row seat to the world of cinema. Before the digital age, when extras were teenagers, the primary duty of a projectionist was to operate the film projectors. This involved loading the film reels onto the projectors, starting and stopping the films at the right times, adjusting focus and framing, and ensuring that the film ran smoothly during screenings. Projectionists were responsible for the quality of the film screenings, and that included inspecting film reels for defects, making any necessary repairs or splices, and ensuring that the picture and the sound were optimal. In theaters with multiple screens, projectionists often had to manage several projectors simultaneously, and this required coordination to ensure that each film started and ended on time. For teenagers passionate about movies, being a projectionist was a dream job. It offered the chance to immerse oneself in the world of cinema, watch movies on the big screen, and gain sight, insight into the film industry. The job provided valuable technical skills that were highly specialized. Teenage projectionists could learn about film projectors, film formats, and audio systems, and that could be valuable for future careers in the industry if they wanted it. Projectionists often enjoyed a degree of independence in their work. They were responsible for their booth and could work at their own pace. Many theaters offered employee perks such as free movie tickets, concessions, or the ability to watch films during off hours. And of course, that was quite appealing for teenagers who loved movies. The late 90s and early 2000s saw the transition from film to digital projection in theaters. This meant that many traditional film projectors were replaced with digital systems, changing the role of the projectionist. With the shift to digital now complete, the demand for traditional film projectionists has declined rapidly. Many theaters no longer require projectionists to operate the digital projectors. Speaking of the movies, once again, another Gen X teen job that no longer exists for the most part is theater ticket sales and concessions. In the 80s and early 90s, before the days of Fandango and other online ticket sales sites, movie theaters primarily used manual ticketing systems. This involved tearing paper tickets from rolls or pads and handing them to customers. Ticket sellers worked in a ticket booth, which was often a small enclosed space at the entrance of the theater. They greeted customers, answered questions about showtimes and seatings, and processed ticket purchases. The job could get really busy during peak movie times, such as weekends and evenings. Long lines of moviegoers would form, especially for popular films or premieres. Transactions were mostly done with cash, so ticket sellers had to handle money, make change, and ensure accuracy in transactions. 
Some theaters encouraged ticket sellers to upsell, so they would offer premium seating options or promote concession combos along with the tickets. The concession stand was a hub of activity, with moviegoers lining up for popcorn, candy, soda, and other snacks. Concession workers prepared popcorn, filled soda cups, and arranged candy displays. They also stocked condiments, napkins, and straws. Just before movie showtimes, especially during intermissions, the concession stand could get incredibly busy. Workers had to work quickly to serve customers while maintaining quality and cleanliness. Between rushes, workers cleaned counters, restocked popcorn machines, and ensured that the concession area was tidy and presentable. Okay, I get that there are still movie theaters operating today, and there are still movie concession workers. However, in my experience, there are usually skeleton crews to handle the popcorn, and the, mas- and the soda machines are like these fancy contraptions in the lobby that customers use on their own after a concession worker hands them a cup that probably costs 8 bucks. People just don't go to the movies like they used to, and the theater experience is nothing like it was back in the 80s and 90s when Gen X teens ran the place. Attention Kmart shoppers. Being a blue light special announcer in the 1980s was a surprisingly fun job for teens. The opportunity to work at Kmart as a blue light special announcer was the chance to make a lively announcement and witness the rush of customers for deals. It was kind of a good time. Working at Kmart in the 80s and 90s, especially as a blue light special announcer, offered a unique and dynamic experience for employees. Blue light specials were like a hallmark of Kmart's marketing strategy. They were these surprise discounts offered on specific items throughout the store, and they were announced over the intercom with these flashing blue lights. The announcements would draw shoppers' attention to the special deal, creating a sense of urgency and excitement. Customers would rush to the designated area to take advantage of the limited time offer. Blue light specials could apply to a wide range of products, from clothing and electronics to household items and toys, and this kept the promotion fresh and interesting for shoppers. The role of a blue light special announcer was to generate excitement and enthusiasm for the blue light special, and this involved making announcements over the store's intercom system, often with a lively and engaging tone. Many who worked at Kmart during this time actually looked back on their experience with nostalgia, remembering the camaraderie, the excitement of the blue light specials, and the satisfaction of helping customers find great deals. Working at Kmart provided valuable retail experience, teaching teenagers customer service skills, teamwork, and the ability to work in a fast-paced environment. You could say the same thing for jobs at Sears, JCPenney, Dillard's, and pretty much any other department store at the time. During the Gen X teen years, though, Kmart was a beloved brand known for its affordable prices and its family-friendly appeal. The Blue Light Special became a cultural phenomenon, and it's often referenced in popular media and advertising at the time. It became synonymous with the thrill of finding a great deal. Portrait studios were all the rage in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. For many families, a visit to Olin Mills or the Sears Portrait Studio was an annual event. I remember one year getting our picture taken at a pop-up portrait studio at Walmart. True story. I think it was in the middle of the baby section. These studios offered a range of photography services, including family portraits, individual portraits, school photos, and specialty sessions. They were a great place for teens to get an after-school job, especially when they started popping up at malls across the country. The focus was on providing customers with high-quality, memorable portraits that captured special moments or created a specific desired image. Sales staff played a crucial role in guiding customers through the portrait process, helping them choose packages, poses, and styles that suited their preferences. They would present customers with various portrait packages, each offering different sizes, quantities, and types of prints like wallet-sized, 5x7, and 8x10s, along with additional options like frames or albums. Sales staff had to explain the studio services, such as the types of photo sessions that were available, family portraits, children's portraits, glamour shots. It would also explain the duration of the sessions and in how if there was any retouching or editing services that were included. Uh, sales clerks were also responsible for upselling additional products or services, such as extra prints and specialty finishes. Many customers and former employees have fond memories of their experiences at Olin Mills, Glamour Shots, or Sears Portrait Studio, recalling family portraits, milestone moments, 
and themed sessions. The Portrait Studios left a legacy of professional portrait photography, I guess you would say, capturing moments in time and creating lasting memories for families and individuals. The glamour shots trend, by the way, became iconic of the 80s and 90s and in its own joke of a way kind of influenced fashion and photography styles of the era. Gen Xers in the 80s loved to celebrate their own birthdays at McDonald's. And then when they became teenagers and some of them got jobs at the Golden Arches, they became birthday party planners. McDonald's birthday parties became a cultural phenomenon, leaving an indelible mark on the memories of those who actually experienced them. The fast food landmark offered various birthday party themes, featuring popular characters like Ronald McDonald, Grimace, and the Hamburglar. Themes could also include the Happy Meal characters, clowns, superheroes, or princesses. Birthday party packages typically included a reserved party area within the restaurant, decorations, party favors, games, activities, and of course food. The party menu usually consisted of kid-friendly favorites like hamburgers, cheeseburgers, chicken McNuggets, fries, soft drinks, and ice cream sundaes. The planner was responsible for booking the party reservations and scheduling the party times. This involved coordinating with parents to choose the desired date, time, and party package. Before the party, the planner would set up the designated party area with balloons, banners, tablecloths, and themed decorations based on the chosen party theme. Of course, you had to have your party at the McDonald's with the best play place. The indoor ones became more popular in the 90s, but 80s kids got to enjoy the outdoor play places. Freaking iconic. One of the highlights of the party was the traditional McDonald's birthday song and cake cutting ceremony. The planner would lead the kids in singing happy birthday and then give the birthday kid a special cake. Each child typically received a party favor bag containing small toys, stickers, or other themed items to take home as a memento of the party. McDonald's birthday parties were known for their lively and energetic atmosphere. Kids were excited to celebrate with their friends, enjoy games, and indulge in McDonald's treats. And as a teenager, you got to plan it all. One of the most common jobs for teen boys in the 80s and 90s was Paperboy. The primary responsibility of this job was to deliver newspapers to subscribers on a regular basis typically in the early morning hours before school started. Paper boys and girls had a designated paper route, which included a set list of addresses or neighborhoods where newspapers were delivered on foot or by bicycle. Before heading out for delivery, paper boys would bundle newspapers together, often using rubber bands or plastic bags for efficient distribution. Paper boys worked in all kinds of weather conditions too, from rain and snow to heat and cold, and this meant braving the elements to ensure timely delivery every day. To help transport and hold the newspapers for delivery, paper boys often used newspaper bags or carriers attached to their bicycles or they would strap it around their shoulders. Some paper boys were responsible for collecting subscription payments from customers, and this involved keeping track of payments received and delivering receipts. Occasionally, these kids had to deal with customer complaints about missed deliveries, damaged newspapers, or other issues. Being a paper boy offered a sense of independence and responsibility. Teenagers were trusted to complete their routes reliably and on time. The job provided physical activity, especially for those who completed their routes on bicycles and on foot. It was a way to stay active and fit. Many Gen Xers look back on their days as a paper boy with nostalgia, reminiscing about the early morning deliveries and interactions with subscribers and that feeling of independence. For many, being a paper boy was a character building experience that taught responsibility, punctuality, and the value of hard work. Paper boys often felt a sense of connection to their neighborhoods and their communities as they became familiar faces delivering news to residents' doorsteps. So that's my list of Gen X teen jobs that no longer exist. What did you think? What was your job as a teenager? What jobs did I miss? Let me know in the comments below. Okay, bye.